and welcome to Combat Thoughts. I'm Robbie. I'm Lee. And I'm Alex. We're going to take a deeper look at the culture and philosophy behind martial arts. Ed, thanks for coming on. Um, You're very welcome. Like we said, let's cover off um, the basis of this podcast, because normally what we do is we just talk about random shit, but we've actually got a kind of topic for this one, so we should probably clarify it um at least start with it, yeah yeah all right so um me and you met at the catch wrestling um world championships uh which are catch wrestling is a small sport so the world championships become populated by oh, don't don't downplay it like i medal don't downplay it let's have it as a legitimate world championship here, okay i'm still i'm still living off this shit so there's, there's no on. reason there's no reason they're not the legitimate world championships however <laughs> We're both Jits guys coming into it, um, attempting to work, make it work in a rule set, which we really have very little idea about um, yeah. and is interesting to transition to. So we've both run into troubles with training for it and transitioning over as one grappling sport to another. So basis of the basis of this podcast is just kind of to discuss that and the transition over and so Jits guys are aware, the rules, fairly simple. Um, there are no points, it's 10 minute matches. You either win by pin or submission, and you basically can't attack chokes where the where there's no arm in. So arm in guillotines are good, guillotines and rear naked chokes, no good, but you can crank the shit out of everything, which makes no sense. Um, so the number of face bars, which is a term that I've heard, but never actually heard used in competition, were through the roof yeah. just the number of people doing horrible shit just like kneeling on each other's spines and cranking on the neck it was just oh, horrendous yeah amazing. yeah 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 it's just so <laughs> but it, you know what the, the, terrifying you know the, the event was fantastic to watch all the same so they're doing something right um mm. yeah i mean cool well, that's the basis how'd you find it it was <laughs> <laughs> so, but why did, so why did you sign up out of interest? Where did you hear about it? Oh, why did I sign up? Um, well, so I trained with Dominic yeah, yeah. Dillon. And, ah, okay, okay, right. okay, yeah, yeah. Dominic's a big fan. Um, and right. we were just, I was just chatting about something. Um, I'm reading a book on like the history of catch wrestling because I like this kind right. of like, I like historical martial arts stuff, like uh, like boxing history in the UK. And then I was like, why not some actual grappling stuff, seeing as I'm an actor. I'm actually a grappler and I don't box, but I like this. Chatting about it yeah. to him, and he was like, "Oh yeah, this is in a month." And I thought it'd be a laugh. To be quite honest, I signed up. I thought it'd be a that, laugh. You, you had a month, yeah. So yeah, you, tra yeah. you train for a month. Okay. Uh, well, that's the other thing, right? So, <laughs> um, we've also got uh, the Brighton Open coming up in a week. Um, so I live in uh, so okay. we live in Brighton. We train in Elements. So we're still very having to be very focused on that so my training for a month was not like oh i'm going to drop jujitsu and we're going to do loads of catch wrestling for a month no it was like yeah. i'm trying to get rounds of catch wrestling in instead of jujitsu in classes or <laughs> we put together some hodgepodge classes on um lunch times when there were no others on but there's only three of yeah. us who are interested in doing it and i was the only one of us who fucking turned up um so <laughs> i thought it'd be a laugh I like the fact three that... is more than I had. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. So it's uh, it's horrible trying to train for a rule set that no one else does. Yeah. And to be quite frank, none of us really understood because all, all, all of us were jits guys. We're not even wrestlers exactly. Um, Dominic Dillon's got all his kimuras, but like, oh, fucking I double know. double wrist locks, double wrist locks, double summer, double wrist locks. Yeah. Yes, so double wrist locks, catch wrestling, proper terminology. Yeah. Um, so why did I sign up? You know other people were doing it i thought it would be fun yeah and it and it was fun it was a fantastic event mm. so i got everything i wanted out of it even if i did have to go up to bolton for it yeah it's quite far it's up it's a long way isn't it yeah <laughs> it's, just, it's further i was gonna say i was complaining it's like four hours for me and i was whinging about it, it must have been much further for you yeah. six hours uh pushing that bloody hell yeah. um but yeah anyway so i i'm relatively similar i i was looking for competitions basically because like when when you get to black belt everyone stops competing um, unfortunately, so it's, it's mm. I've, I've really struggled to get fights um, in gi, no gi, and, and all this stuff. I've been competing against a lot of like purple and brown belts, which is which is good. I'll I'll fight anybody, but um, I, I just wanted some a different bit of a challenge. And I thought I'll just, just do a different sport. Um, 
and it's I, I had four weeks in the end to compete uh, to to train for it. Oh, um, so we were about the same. Yeah, the way the way I did it. I mean, I I looked at it. I read that. I read the rule set before I signed up. That was the first thing. <laughs> I need to make sure that I could actually there's something I could I could work with, and it wasn't something that was so far away from my skill set that I wouldn't be able to kind of work with it. Um, read the rule set, figured out a few things. I was like, okay, I can do that. I can do that. I figured out a way that I might be able to win at this. But then the training was the hardest thing because it's like, I mean, I teach full time. So I teach submission wrestling, no gi. Um, and, and obviously uh, jiu-jitsu in the gi. Well, I, I, I can't switch my classes to catch wrestling classes. So. And just to check, <laughs> when you say submission wrestling, you mean no okay. jiu jitsu, right? Like, okay, so yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I, I use the term submission wrestling or submission grappling. I don't use the term no gi jiu jitsu or no gi bjj because jiu jitsu is in the gi. When it's out of the gi, it's, it's not jiu jitsu. So, it's, I'm very kind, much of, like, kind um, of down that line. Like Dan Strauss, right? Is that the similar sort of That's mindset? The I think? most biggest insult I've ever heard, but yeah, thank you. <laughs> I'm joking. <laughs> you are, you were teammates of Dan, right? Yes, we yeah. were. I was yeah, you trained at uh, Mill. Uh, um, sorry, yeah. I was at Mill Hill for ten years. Yeah, I was at I was at Mill Hill for ten years with with Nick Brooks. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but yeah, I, I they're, they're they're different things, and and again, like they've the gi and, and the the submission wrestling or no gi, whatever you want to call it, have sort of diverged quite a lot in the last maybe three or four years. Mm -hmm. It didn't used to be like that. It used to be you know, used to see people he'll take the gi off and then go and win ACC. Um, that probably won't happen many more times. Yeah. With the exception of many. Maybe the, the Ritolos. Yeah. I, see, I, I was saying to everyone the other day, I was saying Felipe Pena will be the last guy who will be Gi World Champion and, 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 and win, win ADCC. And then fucking Ty Ritolo started putting the gear on. I was like, bollocks. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, that, there's, a, there's, there's a potential there. And Mika Galvao as well, I'm thinking. Yeah, I was going to say so, Mika Galvao for sure. Yeah, those two, I was pretty pretty confident about it. I was like, you know, they're, they're two different sports now. It's not going to happen. And then, yeah, mm. Rotolo and, uh, and Mika, they they could <laughs> they, they could possibly uh, do that again. But um, anyway, yes, yeah, so that's that's the, when I say submission wrestling, submission grappling, I, I basically mean no gi, ADCC, mm -hmm. whatever, you know, yeah. whatever rule set you want to kind of classify under. Um, so, yeah, I was... Um, my my teaching um has to be kind of around those things i can't really i can trick people into doing catch wrestling um and just you know without them realizing it but so my i focus my training when i when i could get my rounds in and and, and people i could train with i i really narrowed it down to a very select few things to work on because like my wrestling's not great at all um it's it's below average if if you know if that uh, i have absolutely no judo i have basically no stand-up i pull guard and leg lock every day everyone yeah. knows that so, like, <laughs> well this is what i'm known for i'm known for pulling guard and leg locking people so i identified a couple of areas that i could i could work with with the takedowns um low single and swing single and the throw by or the slide by which i managed to get i basically the five weeks everything from stand-up was about keeping distance um in order to, to shoot the low singles and swing singles and if i was in close it was about not getting caught with underhooks and having to, to wrestle tight um, and just looking for throw buys and things. So it was, I did nothing else apart from that because I, I needed to spend the, the small amount of time I had, I needed to vote it to the one or two skills that were going to work. So that was, that was one thing. And it was fine. fine that I had a few training partners I could work with for that. Um, and again, it was, it was getting them to understand the rule set though. This was the other thing because it's, it's a difficult one, especially when it went to turtle. Um, and you went down to, to kind of like the knees and four point. Everyone was just like guillotining me, taking my back and darts choking me and shit. And I was like, okay, just, just stop. Okay. <laughs> I'm not defending this because I know I'm not going to be attacked with this because you get, you get a turn, you basically both hands on the floor and you, you post up and in a, in a jujitsu or grappling match, the guy just like, oh, and sees the fuck out of you or just guillotines you and stuff. So it's like, I had to kind of get those guys to understand that it's like, you just have to put me on my back. That's the main thing. Yeah. Um, that took a while so i had a few people who are decent wrestlers that were able to kind of grasp it but with others i just kind of had to work around it and I, even though they were still attacking and they were trying to take my back and things i was i was chill trying to work that rule set um and, and trying to get it to work for me uh it's 
it's a tough rule set as well. I found like you, so I'm I'm quite lazy, and I imagine if anyone who's watched me or knows me that they know I'm quite lazy when I grapple. I would I'm, refer to it as efficient. Efficient, <laughs> efficient, Energy lazy, efficient. Count, counter-attacking, yeah, all these you know clever terms. But I'm, I preserve <laughs> energy, so this, this is the thing. <laughs> there aren't many positions in catch wrestling where you can preserve energy, so that was the one thing I found really, really tough. So the rounds were like, even when when the person takes you down, you 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 have to flip to belly down. You have to go to, or you have to, you can't be pinned. So it's it's really hard to rest in those positions because the person's constantly on you trying to break you down the whole time it isn't like when you're flat on your back and you can just relax flat on your back because you're not having to support that weight and having to move but if you're your belly down you're, you're kind of on you know your turtle position your four point you're carrying weight you're moving it's it's exhausting to do so that that was a big thing there's also uh, yeah. there's also the fact that it's um one one rule that we didn't say is that it's it's like an instant pin. It's yeah. it's it's not a three second pin like in a lot of wrestling. Mm. Um, mm. If you're in motion, if you're like rolling and your shoulders hit the floor, they won't pin you. But yeah. the rules were slightly open to interpretation in that there was just like instant pin, but also plenty of people got away with it if they were rolling in motion. But mm. it's not even one second. Basically, if you throw an ip on and you land on them, you've pinned them. That kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so there's this constant think... fear about going for stuff. Yeah you have to it was that was the thing i really struggled to get my head around so like the, the one thing that really really helped me is like i so if you i'm assuming you did the same thing you went on youtube and you, you tried to find like catch wrestling matches yes there's not a massive amount no but I, I managed to find their show from i think three years ago and it's, it's on on youtube in, the, in its entirety it's like three three and a half hours or whatever and i, I watched that whole thing through um and that that massively helped because I, I read the rule set i started training a little bit and I, I got a feel for the rule set and i had an idea of well, how i was going to work it like what you know the the the, the skill sets that i have that i could adapt to it what i might need to learn a little bit of but it, it gave me an idea of how i was going to train and, and, and what i was going to focus on and then when i when i watched that full show through i got to realize that it's basically you're standing but if you're and if you go to the ground it's it's turtle or basically variations of turtle like that's 90 percent is is that you standing wrestle or it's, or it's a variation on turtle so that helped massively because again i could really narrow down what i was working on so nearly five four weeks basically four or five weeks of it was basically like i was standing wrestling looking at these the, the low singles or like the swing singles or the throw buys or i was in turtle and like I spent, I've never spent so much time in turtle or in like the four point position. Like it was ridiculous, but it's, that's nearly where all the action happens. So that's, there was no point wasting time, like in these other like random positions that I was finding because that, that wouldn't happen in a, in a, in a, in a normal catch wrestling match. I had to kind of watching people who are catch wrestlers fight into those rule sets. I, I basically tried to, to figure out where those positions were. Because again, working catch wrestling with my guys, a lot of us are still trying to do other kind of formats or other rule sets with me. So I was finding myself in some positions which I, I kind of knew weren't going to occur under a catch wrestling format with catch wrestlers. So once I'd seen that and I'd watched that show, that made a big difference as well. I started to rethink the way I was working, especially with the turtle position. And I massively increased the amount of time I was spending in turtle. Um, and I was kind of working off the assumption that I was going to, I was going to shoot a low single or a swing single. If I didn't finish it, I was going to be on a failed single or a grounded single. If that didn't work, I was going to be fighting from, from total four point. And I, I was getting comfortable being there and having to deal with the, 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 the basically the, the, the Nelsons and, and all that kind of stuff from there. So, um, but it's, it's so, it was so far removed from what I'm kind of used to. Um, See, this is what I found interesting about the rule set is that there are no real positions that you wouldn't do in jujitsu. The yeah. stand up is pretty similar. Like, you've still got to look out for Kimuras mm. and su certain submission threats. So, actually, the yeah. wrestling is very similar to yeah. a jujitsu style wrestle. Um, yeah, definitely. The turtle is a position in jujitsu that is fairly frequently seen. 
but the set, but the the way it works is completely different mm. because if people I don't train it though, sure, people but, don't train it. It's a really common position. People don't train it, uh, like, but I, I I do because again, Don we, Dylan and his Kamoras <laughs> and shit. So I'm okay yeah. at it, and I do actually like Pre Mickelson stuff on it. it. It seems to make sense to me. But yeah. if I'm in Turtle, there's well, the main yeah, there's two things I'm trying to do. One is stop them getting on my back. Which no one's going to yep. bother doing, and two nope. is nope. two is trying to sit through to get to guard, and then look yep. to uh, push yep. down. Do. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. suddenly, it's completely yeah. changed the position. You have to redesign turtle completely because I, I'm I'm the same. I'm like I, I don't want it to get the back. I don't want it to get the hooks in, mm-hmm. but they don't care. And I don't want to, again, you're, you've got to defend the neck. You have to be, your neck has to be in, your hands have to protect the neck. Like with this, you don't, you can just stick your head up like a meerkat. Like they're not going to touch your neck. But in Jiu Jitsu, the, the guy's going to finish it. So like the structure of the position is completely different because the threat and the wing conditions are completely different with the position. So that that was the, the biggest thing that the turtle was so, so different. Like, and that's, I, I roll through onto a knee bar, like, and, and a leg lock on two of my fights. And I had to be so careful with it. I took ages playing about with how I was going to do that. Because if I didn't get that right, and I rolled through, and even for a second, I got stalled out in that position, I'd be in a pin position. Mm. So I had to be very certain of the angle and the continuing momentum to bring me through without getting stacked, basically. So I, even with that, I was I was super, super cautious of it. Because it, it, it's it's that it's that idea of pinning, which is just it it changes and it takes away so many like positions basically. Like the back is the main one, as I say. Like because you the back is redundant in in catch wrestling. The, I say the mm. back is in the way we see the back. So I think when they say when catch wrestlers talk about the back, it's just basically being behind the guy in a turtle position. Mm. For us, it's it's a secure back position. It's it's an upper body control. You've got your chest stuck to their shoulder blades. Yeah, your chest is is exactly your orientation is square with them. You have some form of lower body control, be it hooks, you know, long hook, body triangle, half back, whatever. That's that's our back position. Now, why why do we go to the back position though? What's the what's the main goal for the back position? Or finishing? Finishing, but how do you finish? Really naked. The choke. <laughs> yeah, that's illegal. So like, <laughs> that's gone. Okay. So the main reason for taking the back, no point. The other thing is you, you're on the guy's back, the guy plants his feet, bridges, and pins you. So now mm. defensively, you can get pinned as well. So it, it completely takes away any reason for you to be in what we regard as a back position, which is just – it that, that took me so long because the, the way my game has kind of evolved and, and the way my game works over the last maybe five, six years – because of, because of my leg lock game and the, and the way I've attacked leg locks, what has happened, I've become quite well known for it and people have become quite fearful of it. So any time I attack the legs, they turn and they, they run. So I've developed my my game to just take the back. So I, I almost have like, it's, it's almost ingrained in me, any kind of scramble or open position, I'm going to find the back. That's, that's all I'm looking for. I don't even think about it. Like I'm, I'm intuitively going to find the back without having to make a decision. I'm, that's where I'm going. So as soon as I started the catch wrestling, that was like a movement pattern that I, I had to kind of suppress, which was really, really difficult because it had taken me so long to get good at that. And it, and so it, be, it became kind of intuitive. Well, if you want to talk about like the information processing style of, of learning, if, if that, that style of intuitive or kind of system one kind of decision-making, like that's what I do automatically. So now I've got to stop that. So basically I've got to, in those scramble positions, I now have to become very conscious of what's happening. I have to slow it down and I have to make another decision about what I'm going to do. Because if I kind of leave it to this kind of autopilot and heuristics and things, I will just take the back. And I can't do that. So it took me four weeks to suppress this, this kind of back taking system as it were. And I got to a point where it was good. And like, it was four or five weeks. I didn't take anyone's back at all which was weird when i when i took the back someone's back the other day it felt wrong but like now the problem I, the, the problem i've bloody got now is i've got to bring it back so i've suppressed this so much that i'm not taking the back at all and i'm so off the pace any scramble and any opportunity i have to take the back now i'm, I'm missing a lot of them because i'm I, i'm off the pace with it i've kind of 
I, I've suppressed that that movement pattern so much, which is this is the problem between like switching between rule sets, especially rule sets that differ so much as catch and submission wrestling, BJJ and stuff. So like that's the biggest issue I've got now. I, I, I need to, I'm almost going to reprogram myself, which is taking a while because I kind of want to keep with the catch wrestling a little bit, but that's, um, yeah, I don't know. I don't know what you, you found with that, whether there was any, are there any kind of like, is there any certain things that you did and were like your kind of a game and you intuitively did them and they were like, you, you know, there were, there was subconscious decision-making almost. Yeah. And you had to stop that. Well, there's something I want to touch on a bit, but I, I, there was, you know, I'm, I'm big on taking the back as well. Um, but yeah. the thing is, um, like I said, so we've got the Brighton Open coming up and our coach really, really wants the team trophy. So yeah. um, I was still taking the back, so I was not suppressing that nearly as much. So I had to be so much really harder. You, you, you were doing that. both both at the same time. Like Terrible idea. But... I, don't think I, could, I don't think I could have done it. Go on. <laughs> it was a terrible idea. But you know what? Like I said, I was there for fun, but also I didn't even win one match. So take what you will from that. Um but I think apart from the back taking, which is a big one, um, it was going for these Kimuras. And this is what I realized right. in there is I, so Tom Watson is really fucking big for 82 kilos. Did right? you, did you fight Tom? Yeah. Did you fight Tom Watson? Yeah. Oh, I didn't see the fight. He, he looked brilliant. I was really impressed with Tom Watson. Yeah. He did really actually um, and he got caught. sorry about that. I didn't know, man, that's a terrible person to have to fight. <laughs> right. Yeah. So, so I turned up with John Hathaway and we were like, look, me and John were going up. Um, please don't put us in the first match together. So that was a set one. Yeah. There is no one worse that I could have got. Like, yeah. A, a, apart from John, there's no one worse. <laughs> I the could best, have had, the best two guys. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. And they got, both got to the final. Um, and, they like, did they, that on purpose. Oh, you don't want Tom? You don't want John, John Hathaway? Oh, fine. We'll give you Tom Watson then. <laughs> 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 they might have done. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm glad that I managed to. I, 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 just, yeah, I don't know. Maybe he was just being nice afterwards. I did put him in a threat with uh, Kimura from the Turtle, and I think it really deep on the Kimura. And I was starting to talk it round. I was like, in Jiu Jitsu, I could do this. In Jiu Jitsu, I'd yes, flick yeah. my. Because I've got the Kimura, his hips are over that side, his head's over here. And I was like, if I just take my leg closest to him and flick it out around the side, I can just use that to bend the Kimura back. But I was like, mm. I. Like, but he's really he's big tough. and he's really strong, and he's like one yeah. of the only guys who actually cut water, as far as I can tell, to get down to the weight. Uh, yeah, he and looked massive. Yeah, he, he was. Massive. He was talking beforehand about how um, his uh, teammates or his students—I don't remember which—were meant to come along as well and compete yeah. in the division above, and so he had dropped down and otherwise wouldn't have. And you know what? As yeah. soon as I was like underneath someone that big and that strong. I was like, I don't think I can finish this without getting pinned. And so mm. suddenly this Kimura attack, which I was like, I could just try and commit to it, but I think I'm just going to get fucked up. Like, and suddenly there are all these subtleties. And, and since yeah. then I've looked up loads of options. I was like, I know what I could and could and should have done, but it's, mm. it's kind of like yeah. these specific finishing mechanics that work in jujitsu. Yeah. And that, you know, if I, my back will go onto the floor, but it doesn't matter because I'll be cranking this round, but suddenly I can't. Yeah, move. exactly. So it's it's, yeah. it's not just explicit positions; it's little touches, and I imagine that's a lot of what you experienced in the leg lock section of it. That yeah, oh, like the, the I had to completely rethink leg lock stuff. Absolutely, yeah. That that's the thing. But I, I again in the final, I was I was in a I, I had the the affordance to go for a a Kimura at one point. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I didn't because I had the same thought pattern. I was like, I can get this Kimura. I'm pretty sure I'll lock it in. And under a jiu-jitsu rule set, like once I've, once I've locked in a Kimura and I've, I, I've, I've stabilized that control position, I will end up in a better position. But I'm certain I would have to go through a potential pin phase to get to the dominant position. So I, I didn't do it, which is, again, it's so annoying. It's like I can, I can get to a better position with this Kimura, but under this rule set, there will be a part, a phase of that transition that will make me lose the fight. So it's like, mm -hmm. right, I can't do that, clearly. Yeah. So I, because I looked, I played about with Kimura. So I know, obviously, Dominic's very, very good at them as well. I saw him, the the show I watched, he pinned someone with the Kimura. 
and I I hadn't even considered the Kimura up to that point until I watched the show mm-hmm. like three years ago, and mm-hmm. I saw saw Dominic pin someone with the Kimura, and that kind of put you know gave me a light bulb moment as well about the idea of using the control system of a Kimura to pin, but knowing from a turtle position, if I roll through, potentially if I don't get it working fluidly and he stalls it out midway, it, it, it's a pin. And I was very, very aware of that. And with the leg lock stuff, there's so many leg lock entries where you have to invert through and you have to roll through the shoulders. Um, it's, and it's, again, a lot of my a lot of my leg lock entries are from underneath. And I, I, there's no guard. Like, you can't play a guard. It's, the, <laughs> the guard is turtle, which we all know isn't a guard. So it's I so think, difficult. I, turtle. I still think turtle's a guard. IBJJF don't agree. But, yeah, well. well the thing, again, it's like, it's what you see... <laughs> Basically, gra- grappling is gra- like grappling is. Where I see it, like, grappling is everything. It's, it's jujitsu. It's submission wrestling. It's catch wrestling. It's it's sambo, it, it, you know, judo, whatever. Mm-hmm. And like everything is grappling. And we all have really, really similar systems. And we have there's a lot of crossover, a lot of you know, similar patterns between all these kind of grappling arts. The, the the thing that makes the styles makes judo judo makes sambo sambo catch wrestling catch wrestling is the rule set. So whatever kind of grappler you are, you, whatever rule set you go to, you will optimize your your movements, your techniques, and your movement pattern to that rule set. That's that's the thing. That's the difference. So you switch over to another rule set, and the chances are, if you spend a long time working at one rule set, you're very optimized, and your movements optimized, and everything is optimized to that rule set. And you have to switch that because, like, pinning is another one. Like, pinning is just we don't know we don't understand pinning at all because like wh- when do we ever pin people we don't need to pin people because we can't win that way mm-hmm. it's like when judokas transition over to jiu-jitsu and they'll they're at a judo they're at a jiu-jitsu competition and they'll hit a massive massive throw like a, a huge kind of hip throw and it'll be a nip on but they'll over rotate it because they always over rotate it because they really need to make sure they get that hip on mm. but in reality the over rotation creates an ongoing movement afterwards and they end up under under the person and they've scored nothing but in in judo you've just won the fight so you have to like you with most of your throws in judo you're going to be over rotating and you're going to be focusing on getting your opponent's shoulders to hit the mat you're not going to be focusing on getting your opponent to the ground on top in a control position so for judo guys that's again it's a massive thing because they're optimized towards this this one win condition, which isn't in other rule sets. And again, this is why, you know, we're all grapplers. We all understand head control, underhooks, you know, basic throws, limb control, all this kind of stuff. We all know this, but we use it to, to win under a different rule set. So whatever rule set we're under is going to massively shape how we do that. Because over time, we're going to find the best way of winning under the rule set. Right? And that's that again, this is why I found catch so interesting because it, it forced me to, to take what I had as a, as a skill set and see if I can adapt that skill set in four weeks to a different rule set, which mm. I find quite an interesting puzzle. So, so I just completely rambled there, haven't I? I apologize for that. That's the idea of the pod. The best bits are rambles. Um, uh, yeah, you, this is probably not the last one. I apologize. Now. <laughs> <That's okay. laughs> um, uh, yeah. So the thing, the thing I always find is that, mechanics in all grappling arts are essentially the same but it's like and so my understanding of it is absolutely fine i mean maybe i need to research certain moves and techniques but generally speaking if we go through a technique i'll understand everything about how it's working why it's working and even what objectives you've got absolutely which is which is essential absolutely essential the thing that gets me is the subconscious bits so it's like like you were saying about the back going for that it's that Mm. okay subconsciously I'll just, you know, because if you're thinking about it, unless you've got them pinned and you're really thinking about carefully what you're doing, unless you've got them not necessarily pinned, but you've got great control over them, you can't be thinking about every single move you're doing. That's what I find the problem is. It's your unconscious reactions and what you're just trying to do out of instinct. That's the yeah. thing that's true. That, that's, where, that's where it completely moves away from the vast, vast majority of instructors in the uk and 
especially jiu-jitsu and, and stuff like that they, they won't go into it. like if you i mean you can go to any club the majority of clubs there's there's some there's some very good coaches and there's a very good coaches to have a good understanding of learning theory but you can go to 90 99 of, of clubs in the uk and you can you can discuss this and you can say well you know why why do you teach this way why do you why do we drill passively you know why why do we drill this certain thing or why do we spar this way and I guarantee the vast, vast majority of them will not be able to answer you. And they will also not be able to answer you and put that into a framework of any kind of like, like learning theory or, or of why, especially when it comes to, 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 to motor skills. Like, this is basically what we're doing. We are, we're trying to learn a motor skill. Okay. Albeit a very complex motor skill, mm -hmm. which is dependent on a rule set, as we said before. Now it's, it's not, if you have no understanding of how, people acquire motor skills and they learn motor skills, then I don't understand how people teach because <laughs> and I, it bothers me because I mean, where, what do you need? What qualifications do you teach in the UK? You need a belt and it's like, oh, you're a purple belt. That's good. You should probably teach them. It's like, you've never taught before though. So yeah, but it's obviously the same, isn't it? No, teaching is a completely different skill to actually being able to do any kind of grappling art. So and like, as far as I'm concerned, you, if, however you're teaching, you have to understand, I, I, you need to understand the theoretical grounding of it. Like I, I wouldn't, you don't have to go so far into the academic side of it. And, and cause I think some people hugely over intellectualize it and they, they go too far down that route, but you need to know the, the, the kind of the idea and the model you're using and you're teaching. Um, at, at the minute there's like, as far as like skill acquisition is concerned and, and, and skill development, there's, there's two very kind of key models and they're really starting to cross over now which is very very interesting so there's this thing there's, there's, there's people now that are starting to talk about it which they haven't been for the last couple of years which i found very very interesting um like lachlan's jumping on board which is which uh -huh, is good uh -huh. um we'll talk about the flip classroom stuff as well actually because this is something i've been thinking about for a couple of years um you have obviously you had pre tom yes pre has a very good understanding of it uh, Preet has an, a, a good understanding of basic kind of learning theory and, and, and how, how you do things. Um, you have, um, do you know the guy from, this guy called Andy from conceptual grappling. What is it called? Yeah. Is it school of school of grappling? He's got two. He's got conceptual mm. grappling. He's got school yeah. of grappling and they're he's subtly, interesting. subtly different, but yes, excellent. He's, he's, he's an interesting guy. Like the, he, he's on the right track maybe too far down the, the kind of ecological dynamics side, but he's, he's on the right track. Um, as I say, starting to break through now, but they're, they're teaching and they're, they're teaching, looking at the actual way of, of, of the learning and, and how you acquire the skill, not just basically bringing people in and just teaching them a technique and then doing the technique. Like that's, it, it's, the tradition of uh, of like jujitsu and stuff is just like it, it's terrifying. The amount of people I've questioned about this and gone, "Why do you teach like that? Why do you do that?" And they go, "Oh, we've always done that. My teacher told me, and then their teacher did that." It's like really brilliant. Can you imagine if medicine worked that way? <laughs> like, oh, well, you know, we've been doing this for two hundred years. What do you mean you don't like leeches? Like everyone be dead. It's like well, why? Why in like it's it's another reason. Like I think a few other people have, have, have kind of caught on with it. I don't. I, I don't like the term martial arts anymore, which is sad because I think the term martial arts is, it, 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 it kind of, it, it's a tradition thing. Everyone talks about tradition and respect and everything. And the respect thing's great, but the tradition thing, that's great. But why are you not trying to optimize what you're doing? You're basically sticking with tradition because it's just tradition and you want to pay respect. It's like, well, but you could be better. Like, why, why, why wouldn't you, why wouldn't you do that? Why wouldn't you, try and develop the system you're doing and just progress like every other aspect in the world. No one, no other kind of, you know, sector of, 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 you know, business or anything like that or sport have just stood still. They've mm. carried on. But as soon as you use the term martial arts, it's like, you can't do anything new. You can't, you definitely can't train in a different way. And then there's this whole familiarity effect of like, well, you do anything different. Everyone's like, this is not the right way. It's like, that's because you're used to the other way. That means, you know, <laughs> I think this, this is like a massive kind of worms, by the way. <laughs> so, uh, well, it's, it's a really, I it's really interesting. I haven't and even I, got started ranting on this shit yet. So uh, to be honest, we've, we've done podcasts before and like learning stuff. Well, 
actually what our podcast was on was related to um basically like should black belts be teachers just because they're black belts and the conclusion yeah. no, no, I, I, I <laughs> that no. it's a different thing <laughs> like, again like skill so the, the 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 application and and the the, the ability to perform a skill is 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 not the same as the ability to teach a skill mm -hmm. Like that, that's the thing. I, some of the, the best people I've ever trained with, like the, the, the most skillful and the best practitioners of, of jujitsu, grappling, whatever you want to call it, have not been the best teachers. Some of the best teachers and some of the people I've learned the most of haven't been the, the, the best a, a, applying that skill set mm. because it's not the same thing. Now, I think you need, you need a certain level of knowledge to develop that high level skill. And even having that knowledge, you know, separate from the ability to perform the skill, you have to be able to communicate that knowledge across in an understandable way. And, and, and again, an understandable way to all different levels, all different types of people and in all different settings. And like, it's really, really difficult, but people seem to think they get a black belt and they can do this straight away. It's like, I'm, I, I've been teaching for maybe seven or eight years now and I'm still, my, I, I still, I'm still constantly experimenting and learning stuff. Like it's, it's really, really fucking difficult, really difficult. I always find it interesting that um, this is kind of a thing in jujitsu culture that to teach you need a black belt. But I mean, I don't know any professional teachers, like actual school teachers. They've all done a fucking course mm. on how to do that job. They haven't just gone straight off of yes. their PhD or yes. whatever, straight into yes. teaching stuff because it's a, yeah. important to have the knowledge. It's a different yeah. skill set. You have to learn other stuff. And we just seem yeah. to ignore that fact in yeah. the sport. Yeah. If you switch to academia and like, like teaching in that setting. So if we go to that, some of the most terrifyingly intelligent people I've come across and like absolute geniuses in the field, they can't teach it. They can't no. speak to people. They have no social skills. Like they, it's, it's, it's like they're a different thing. They push the field forwards, but they, they 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 don't they can't they can't teach it. That's it's 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 a set, similar sort of thing. Like it's a different skill. It's an absolutely different skill. The attributes they have allow them to be insanely good at you know whatever area they're working on, and you know push boundaries and stuff. But that that skill set is so it's so kind of like systemized, and ha ha uh, kind of optimized to what they do that they can't do they can't communicate well. Because communication is a completely different skill. It's like it's like looking at intelligence and just and, and judging someone's intelligence by like an IQ test. It's like yeah. that's one form of intelligence. You, you have no emotional intelligence, social intelligence. It's not, that's, that's you know you're you're looking at a very narrow form of intelligence. It's the same with teaching that you're basically assuming that someone can apply that the, you know teach jujitsu and, and, and communicate jujitsu because they have that one high level of of jujitsu or that high level kind of characteristic, and it, they're completely different. Like with, with my guys, I, I work with, there's a few of my guys that I work with now with coaching and I work with the teaching. I won't just basically go, if I'm away, I won't go, right, well, you're the highest grade you teach because like some of them aren't very good teachers. Some of them don't want to do it. But like a lot of my classes when I'm away, it, it will be like a, a purple belt or a brown belt teaching and there'll be other, there'll be black belts in the class, but they don't, they're not annoyed because they get it. Because they, they understand that they understand how I teach, and they understand how these other people teach as well, and they can they can separate the the application of skill from the ability to teach that skill. They're completely different, and then it comes down to why I hate the grading system and belts. <laughs> so it's like, it doesn't <laughs> help. Like everything, basically everything I talk about is going to lead on to something else I have a problem with. So but yeah, you come in like you come in as a you visit you come in as a lower, like a, a brown belt or a black belt, and you're visiting a club. And the instructor's a purple belt. Like, what's the first thing you think? Like, well, this is a purple belt. But that purple belt might be somebody Incredibly who is good like a, PH a PhD. Yeah, PhD in sports science and skill acquisition and all this kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. They may be an incredible teacher. But you come in and you see that purple belt and then you look down, you see your black belt and you're like, well, why aren't I teaching the class of my black belt? Mm, that's, like, um, that's this, a is, this is the problem we're fighting with the whole time. That's another. Right. That's another one of Preet's things. It's about like um, white belt people. He keeps talking about people, people seeing people as white belt people, and that's that's why I have my my Instagram handle yeah. as white belt warrior. I agree with him on that. <laughs> I agree with him on that.
I agree with him on that. Yeah, I have it again. I get it. Like, I have a massive problem with anyone saying no, they they don't want to roll with a white belt. They don't want to roll with a new person, or they have an issue with it, and they're like, oh, "I just don't get out of it." It's like, okay, if you roll with a white belt, or you roll with a, a crap blue belt, or a new guy that's never done anything, if you don't get anything out of it, that's because you've not approached the spar and the roll in the correct way. Like, that's on you. And I have like one of the common things I hear from white belts is they they don't like rolling with with high grades sometimes because they feel like they're wasting the high grades time. Now, if the higher grade feels you're wasting the time then they're a fucking idiot and they don't understand how to train correctly. Like that's ultimately what it comes down to. Like, and that I guarantee it will never be a high level guy. It will be a guy mm. that's probably plateaued at purple belt, brown belt, and they're still shit. They'll always be shit. And they probably should never get a black belt, but you know, time spent on all that shit. And they, they will basically bitch fantasy. about rolling with white belts. <laughs> well, yeah. well, this is what it is. It's all that fucking time. It's like, you know, it's, well, I should definitely get a belt now. It's like, and then as an instructor, it's like, well, Jesus, we can't not give them a belt. Like, <laughs> I don't want to give certain people belts. Like, I, I think I've, I've heard it before. I think Preet may have said it or Andy may have said it from the, the, the School of uh, mm-hmm. Grappling. Yeah. And like, I 100% agree with it. Um, or it may have been, you know, it may have been uh, Benaki um, from uh, Island Top Team in Vancouver. Yeah, 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 yeah. He says there's certain people are, that should never get black belt. I, mm. I agree with that. Ooh, not heard any of them say it's that. Terrible. Well, this is the problem because like everyone should be able to get a black belt. That's fine, but like everyone should probably be able to get a PhD then as well. Yeah, yeah, it, it is true. Actually, in in that respect, I do no. think I think you have you have got a point because it's not like everyone can be get, can get a masters everyone can get a bachelor's like if you don't do the yeah. right kind of work and you don't show the That's right the skills absolutely everyone should be a premier league footballer they, 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 they should they, they should have, everyone should have the opportunity everyone should have the opportunity to play for a premier league football team right well no if you crap you crap i'm sorry but like that's that's how it works it's and unfortunately with jiu-jitsu it's it, it comes down to money again and like if I, you know, if any of my students, then I, to be fair, most of my students understand the, the kind of crazy shit I come out with anyway. But there, there'll be some people that like won't want to train with me because they'll be like, ah, oh, maybe I won't get a black belt. Yeah, you, you might not, um, <laughs> but you'll be really good. But you're fucking. Really but you're still pretty. You but you, well, this thing, you'll be really good. You, you'll probably fuck up a load of other black belts. But that's not necessarily because you're a black belt. That's because everyone else grades badly and they don't give a fuck about the grading system. And they will throw black belts out to any idiots because they've been there for ten years and they've been loyal. It's like, well, mm. you know, it just makes them look bad. So, <laughs> yeah, I think, I think with, with, um... <laughs> <laughs> we're going to ruffle some feathers, but that's all right. We'll get more I mean, views. for sure. It's yeah. Fine. I, I mean, I mean there there are, people there's... hate me in the community anyway. It's fine. There's so, yeah, there's so many, <laughs> there's so many points of view on it. And I, and I could see, I could hear like in my head, like people saying, yeah, but also the belt represents the, the hard work you put in and these yeah, sorts of no, things. Well, that's, yeah. But, but, yeah. I, but I also agree with what you're saying because if we're if we're talking about jujitsu, especially now as a sport, it's a skill, and skills should be in some way quantifiable, and and it should they should be uh, achievable yeah. by some form of standard. Obviously, in jujitsu, it's very hard to set an exact standard. Like it's stupid to set techniques and yeah, whatever. We don't- we don't have a we don't have a universal standard, and I don't think we ever can. So that that that's kind of the issue, yeah. Not without a governing body, but that's a topic for another time. <laughs> yeah, well, and yeah, something yeah. That I don't. We do have, how much would the IBJJF want to be paid for that? Fuck you know. Because <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. they would be like, oh, okay, yeah, sure, we could make. Okay, guys, we uh, we now have a universal syllabus for everybody. It's going to cost <laughs> you two thousand pounds per academy. Every individual will have to pay for it. So. Um, yeah, I, I, I don't want to go off on the IBJJF, but that's another thing. We I'm can not, do that like. some other time. <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a whole other podcast of why I dislike the IBJJF. Um, again, I've I've gone off on a massive tangent. And where where did I get? Where did I start this tangent? Why did we start? So we are talking about well, we're talking about learning systems and teaching right. systems, and the reason we got onto that was partly because we were talking about the fact that you're subconsciously learning certain skill sets and you have yes. to unlearn certain things. Um, yeah. that is again that that the subconscious thing it comes down to what kind of school of thought you look at with um mm-hmm. especially with the decision making um when it comes to learning whether it's the, there's there's two basically kind of distinct schools of thought nowadays with uh with 
kind of motor skills or skill acquisition learning and it's it's information processing which is the old school kind of classic one that like mental models and and, and, and schmidt schema theory and everything um and then the more modern one which everyone is kind of jumping on board uh which is the eco ecological dynamics which is basically it's ecological psych psychology combined with like dynamical systems theory um and that that seems to be the path that like a lot of the a lot of the guys are kind of going down um a lot of the again people like pre does a little bit like it and and, and, and again andy from uh school of grappling does is very much down that side of it um but it's the, the the problem is with that so basically with the ecological dynamics it's very very hard to teach that way in my opinion because what what it comes down to is what you, you you give very little information and it's it's basically putting people into positions and allow it you restrict them and constrain them enough so it isn't completely free but you then allow them to work in those positions mm -hmm. and it, it comes down to them experiencing it and over time there will be this emergent pattern of movement which which will work for them like this this is the problem because it takes a long time and mm. you get guys to do that and they're like well, why aren't you showing us anything because they want the traditional kind of like spoon-fed style of like uh, like rote learning that uh, 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 do this do that do this technique okay which is what we're all kind of used to but where where the kind of the the more ecological dynamic approach works better than than the way the information processing one is applied now is that you find that you end up doing more actual jujitsu or grappling hmm. in the ecological dynamics yes because they don't have this idea of passive or non-resistant work which is, a, is again is another thing which i just it gets to a point so if we, if we start from the beginning if any jujitsu class you do you will come in and most of them you'll do maybe 15 minutes of them teaching you a warm-up which, which is pointless because you don't well you don't win you don't win competitions by being really good at warm-ups yeah i and mean we can also talk so, about the horrors of warm-ups and the fact that you're just shrimping up and down it's not a war there's not a warm-up that's not what a warm-up this is, is the point <laughs> this is the point that that uh, that idea of a solo movement like that just shrimping up and down the map okay now when you do it you, you well, I, i'm not maybe maybe your instructors now i'm not gonna gather them or whatever but like as you're going through that movement what are you are you just are you thinking about the movement or are you just doing it are you, are you thinking about trying to maximize the movement are you thinking about elbow positioning are you thinking about what it would be like to, to be shrimping away from an opponent on you or are you just doing it to get to the end of the mat and come down again so the warm-up finishes and get on with it well um when i do it which we don't actually shrimp very much and i'm very thankful for that at my gym we shrimp very <laughs> little especially yeah um but in previous times when i've done it you know what i have optimized for is getting as far down the mat as possible with each shrimp it's movement which is that's just hip movement that, that's, right. that's that's all shrimp is all the shrimp is your, your goal is to get your hips to move as far as you possibly can like that's the key and again it's it, it's the problem is when you look at that it's an uncontested shrimp you can do the perfect shrimp every time if you get it right okay your heels will be right to your ass you can really move the hips you can do everything now when you're in a fight when you actually have to shrimp in a in a in a, in a scenario where you're grappling how often you, uh, can you put yourself in the optimal position to execute the perfect shrimp you know what i don't remember the last time i consciously shrimped in a roll <laughs> you probably will do it a lot you probably will but like it'll be like mini shrimps it won't be yeah. a like a textbook yeah. shrimp yeah i've never thought because explicitly you're, like they're the they're... conditions are completely different absolutely mm -hmm. so why the fuck are we doing it because it doesn't occur why do footballers dribble around cones there's no fucking cones on the pitch this is the point like <laughs> with, with that the issue i have is you are again it comes down to the idea of you are trying to you were trying to get to this perfect movement and you're trying to find the perfect shrimp under what would ultimately be the perfect conditions because there's nobody stopping you there's nobody holding your your, your pant leg your knee you're not getting cross face at the time you're not kind of trying to frame off a, a cross face so you have no threat whatsoever you never have you are never going to get those conditions when you're grappling so you're shrimping and your hip movement 
should come from working in those positions because that's when you're going to learn to, to, to become adaptable and, and to, the, to the variability in the position. You're not going to have a perfect movement. You're never going to replicate those conditions in a fight. Never. So why are you doing something which is completely unreplicated and just completely so far removed from the actual act of, of, of the sport and, and, and fight that you're doing? Like that's why I don't get it. <laughs> if you know, I understand that they try to want to get the movement, but once you understand how a, a shrimp works, a hip escape works, whatever, why why are you just doing it up and down the map? Because you know how it works. Yeah. Like what's going to make it an efficient shrimp is being able to apply that when you have other conditions and you have the outside interference and you have the contest. Like that's where the practice has to come in. So I think the problem is there's obviously the whole problem that you've not got someone on top of you and everything like that. But I think that that could be avoided if you actually had a scenario. And I don't know what this scenario would be, but something where you are actually doing a realistic shrimp. I think part of the trouble is that what I'm optimizing sure. for is yeah. so and the, the comparison I'd make is that you don't necessarily need someone doing the actual thing in order to learn the movement properly. Uh, if we're talking about Andy again, he discusses yeah. something he does with kids to start to get them to learn the basic mechanics of a foot sweep. And that mm. is when they're doing judo, they'll put one sock on and all they have to do is try and like stamp on the other person's foot with the socked foot. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, yeah. Right. It's not actually very much, in a lot of ways, it's not actually very much like what sparring is, but it's mm. got the right stuff there. But there's a reaction. Yes. Yeah. There's, there's, there's a reaction. The problem is you are taking away a critical source of information from what's going to happen. You do not have the reaction and, and the, the, the movement of an opponent. Now that changes everything. So the more time you spend working on a movement or a sequence or a technique or whatever terminology you want to use without those stimuli and, the, and those, the, the, those kind of actions opposing it, what's the point? Because it's going to completely change the way you do it. You, you don't have that. You have no other kind of outside interference. Like, of course, you're going to be able to do this perfectly. But that isn't what grappling is. That isn't what jiu-jitsu is. Like, the idea of the shrimp is to be able to create space to, to escape the position, to move to another position, to go from there. But you're creating space away from nothing. You have no reference point of another person. You have no actions of another person, no reactions, nothing like that to work off. So it doesn't transfer. There is no skill transfer, in my opinion, from practice to ultimately what would be performance or you know doing the action in a live situation so it's I'm kind trying of to think of a, of a of a in like um of a similar thing in terms of for example learning to squat it's as if it's as if you um right. you're trying to perfect a squat with a body weight uh just a body weight squat and you had the perfect technique and then you just immediately put 100 kilos on top of you and then try to do the squat with the same technique, yes. but you've never, you haven't yeah. actually had the school, um, like acquiring the skills of having the weight on your back and being able to yeah. squat under some resistance. I think I, I, I get, I, sorry, yes, go. I think it might be even worse than that because the shrimp is a movement within a technique. At least the body weight squat is a so technique and it's pretty it. close right like it's mm. like yeah it's, it's like you've it's, also it, it, it's not even it's, it's like you've done half of a body weight squat or a quarter yeah. it's like you've done a little bit of it yeah, yeah. I, again like so the, the difference is you when you when you squat okay when you, you're doing your body weight squat and then you put the bar on and stuff you know how that bar is going to behave okay you yeah, that bar true. is it's not going to do something mm. This is the point. You know how it's going to behave. Mm. So you, it, it is not going to, it has no mind of its own. It is going to do what mm. it does. It's going to move. It's going to, the weight is going to be where you put it. It's going to stay there. It's not all of a sudden going to jerk off to the side. Mm. Okay. Now in jujitsu, this is the difference. Like the person is not a dead weight. The person has a mind of its own. The person is going to move in completely different ways. There's going to be so much, there's so much variability within that. 
that for squatting, I, working on that form, 100%, I get it, because you, you are working towards a perfect form and a perfect technique. And you can almost get it in that because there's significantly less variability. Now, you cannot have a perfect shrimp in jiu-jitsu because there's too much variability. There is too many extraneous variables at play. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. You can't control what the other person does in that sense. You can't control their movement. You, they are going to move in completely random ways. I mean, Jesus Christ, how many times, like, it, it's easier with higher grades. You get a white belt that's never trained before. Like, I still, like, I will still now train with people that are never trained, and they will do things I've never seen before. I, I'm never, that they will literally do stuff that I didn't even know was possible. And this happens, <laughs> still happens. <laughs> I've never, I haven't got to the point where I can understand all the possible things a new person can do. Like they still amaze me. Like now a bar with weights, again, it's predictable. Hmm. It, it isn't going to move. It's going to move if you, your form changes slightly. So that it, it's affected by you unless you're outside and there's, there's the wind is at play or something like that. There's no other real extraneous variables apart from your yeah. body because that weight doesn't really change. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's a good it's a good analogy, but it, it really emphasizes the variability in jiu-jitsu mm. compared to something like that. So I found it interesting what you said about um, white belts and the fact they'll do random shit that you've never seen someone do. Insane. Yeah. I reckon. Absolutely. Can I ask it? Have you done other? Have you done any striking martial arts when you were younger? Anything like that? Boxing or <sighs> Muay Thai? I did. I did. I did Wing Chun. Hangs his head in shame. <laughs> That's all right, mate. We all, we all, I have. I work with MMA guys. I've, you know, I look at this stuff. Mm -hmm. I, I watch it. I study it. I, I don't practice it. So I have yeah. my knowledge is okay. My application of striking is piss poor. Okay. I wouldn't even attempt to teach it. I wouldn't. There is no way I would attempt to teach anyone how to do any kind of striking. Well, on, <laughs> unless it's on the ground, which is different. But like, well, yeah, reckon no way. <laughs> Maybe Alex is the one to back me up on this one. And I think the reason that beginners do so much random shit is actually a lot more obvious in striking. Um, people who go to gyms where you spar light, especially with beginners, as you should, uh, but unfortunately, as you may not in a lot of places, um, <laughs> often find, I mean, Alex, uh, do you find when you're sparring with complete beginners, they'll get you way, way more than they ought to they're way harder to spar than they really should be, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. You know sure. why? There's no fear. I agree with that. There's yeah. no fear in them. Because the way the to be... are terrifying. <laughs> yeah, but the thing <laughs> is, especially in striking where there's an actual fear of getting hurt, the way... Yeah, if, you, okay, if you want okay, to stop okay. someone doing random shit to you, you don't, you don't have to beat them up. You have to put them under pressure. Because under pressure, suddenly the guard starts coming up. They're a lot more defensive. They're not just winging punches from their waist. And suddenly by putting pressure on them, they're responding in a much more realistic way, which is, I don't want to get fucking hit rather than trying to hit you like a punch bag, right? With jiu-jitsu, it's less obvious. And I think the reason is that, one, they're not actually going to get hurt. And it's like, you know how people get boxed, like, Boxing has this common appeal because people look at it and they go, I kind of, they don't understand the Absolutely. subtlety. They know, they know what boxing looks like. Yeah. They can mimic it. They can Punch, copy it. hits, face. Whereas jujitsu, yeah. you look at it, you're like, I don't know what the fuck is going on. So of course, when you get a white belt come in. I still don't know. Yeah. <laughs> right? We still don't know. It's I, so, I still don't get it. Right? Like, and, and it's more 100%. obviously complicated. So a white belt comes in and they're just doing all sorts of random shit. But I agree. If they suddenly started coming under, the, if there was suddenly a fear of them getting hurt or understand it, or, or if they wanted to actually win and understood about the points and that you're just absolute and that you you are actually just racking up points on them, even though they're doing random stuff, I think mm. people's behaviour would change quite substantially. Mm. I no, I, I agree. I agree. Yeah, yeah. It's um. <clears throat> so basically, you're saying we should base be harder on white belts to make them scared <laughs> so that they, they're not as annoying <laughs> that's yeah the, ta the takeaway fact is in boxing they, they realize there's danger they can get hurt and just they don't so what my solution would be we just kick the shit out of white belts more so they have that fear of danger and they don't do as much 
I if, like it. If your only goal <laughs> is to stop them doing random shit, really like this. <laughs> your only goal is to stop doing random shit. Then yes, this is an appropriate solution. If you want to it's, have it's any, a very other, good point. Though. Maybe you will yeah, lose every single point. other benefit, but yes, it's a, it's but, a very it's a very very good point. <laughs> Uh, to go, going kind of back to to having some form of resistance and it actually being a way to to learn a skill, I think it it poses a sort of interesting question uh, because for me, like you know, you could you could look back uh, in the history of jujitsu and I mean, people have done all right learning this kind of way, right? We think okay, so so we we would think people have done all right doing this kind of way. So you drill a technique, then you spar. Um, but my question is, is it possible then that actually the squill acquiring happens during sparring and it's, I mean, some form of squill, squill, skill acquirement must happen during like w when you're actually drilling a technique without any resistance, I get some of it must do cause you, you are sort of understanding the movement and whatever, but does it, is it actually within the, the um within the the time where you, when you're actually doing something under resistance that you fully you know you fully acquire that skill and it's actually that time that's more productive okay that that's a, again that's a that's a good point so the way the way i see it so if i'm if i'm teaching something completely new to somebody and like they've never seen you know there's no there's no reference for it they're, they're anything similar and it's I refer like as, as a movement pattern, for instance. I, I, for anything I refer to as a movement pattern is just like a technique, basically. It's like the way a technique would normally work. It's the way the body would move and the pattern of movement in the, the body would do to apply basically like a knee slice. Mm. So because with the knee slice, you have to create the angle, you have to turn the hip. And there are specific movements of the body that we know are relatively optimal and are going to kind of work, okay? So once they have that, which doesn't take that long with a non-resisting opponent or a, or a, a complying opponent, someone who's going to move the right way and let them them do it the right way. Okay. So they, they understand how that starts to feel and how it starts to work. Okay. So they they learn that, but that is never going to be the skill. The skill is the ability to apply that to a resisting opponent and that you will never acquire without resistance because it's a, it's being able to adapt and apply the, the, the general skill, to the reaction of the opponent and that comes into things like timing decision making all this kind of stuff okay there's, there's a lot of micro adjustments and things that are going to have to be done but you'll never learn that unless you have the realistic resistance however the when when it, you, the split normally is passive or non-resistant drilling then sparring okay so it's almost one extreme to the other zero percent 10%, whatever, and then you have like 100%, okay? Neither of these conditions are good for skill development and skill acquisition. Mm. It's, it's, it's as simple as that. With no resistance, it's so far removed from the, the, the conditions you're actually going to be competing or, or training under that there is no transfer of skill from practice to performance or from practice to, to application. 100%, you never, you're not going to get to work on the decision making and learn the decision making and have time in positions where you can play about and explore and it's this this exploratory kind of idea is is really really kind of important as one well. you see it a lot in wrestling but again you don't see it in jiu-jitsu like for me the vast majority of the training with my guys is 50 60 percent resistance okay mm. so i'll set them up in a condition and i will I'll tell them what I want them to do from top and the bottom and they'll work it for three minutes. If the position breaks down, they'll start again. They'll go again for three minutes and then they'll switch, but it'll be 50, 60%. So you have to learn how to train that way as well though, because if someone doesn't know how to train that way, it, it's going to be very difficult. If you're finding it really easy, like the knee slice, if you're finding it really easy, the knee slice, the person's not very good at the resistance and not going to get it right, make it a little bit harder for yourself, for instance. Maybe put yourself a little bit further back. Maybe, maybe use like a, a, a different grip position or something like that. So that drill, you're then still going to get good kind of improvement out of. You have to almost gain and, and, and kind of implement the difficulty yourself as well. Does that make sense? It's got to be difficult. 
Like, mm. And that's where that 50, 60% comes in. But it can't be impossible. If you've got a beginner trying to apply a technique to someone who's going 100%, it's not going to work. Mm. Okay? You're not going to get a chance to be a play about in those positions and stuff. It's this this middle ground of exploring and playing. And again, it's a common thing people are talking about, but people don't see us training. Now that, in my opinion, is where you develop skill. That's where you acquire skill. Okay. However, if you train solely like that, you will be shit in competition. You will get battered. <laughs> okay. Because again, that when you develop that skill and you get that and you start to understand, you need to be able to apply a hundred percent. So then you then you will put it your your competition game in into practice. Just you see what I mean? There's different types of training. This is the thing, and everyone needs to work in these different kinds of sets of training. But unfortunately, everyone just does passive drilling sparring. Andy has spoken about this quite a lot about the the grey area or the grey zone, right? Yeah, that's absolutely, it, right. So hundred percent. What you're talking about? That's where you get better. Um, drilling, which is. You know what? The term drilling means something very different to me. Like, this is the thing. Right. Yeah. So, before I go on to my main point, this has always bothered me is that, yes, drilling could be the perfect way to learn jujitsu. Obviously, with sparring on top, could be the perfect way to learn jujitsu. What people yeah. do for drilling, I don't think is what the majority of other sports and practices would refer to as drilling. Absolutely. It's, it's just this. I don't know what it is. I don't know what it's called, but it's like... Look um, at wrestling. Look at wrestling. Wrestling is the, the easiest comparison. Right. That is not drilling. Right. If you And if you were to talk about like in, I don't know, like military drills, mm. they do something that's almost like what they would actually do, but without the same pressure, right? That's what drilling is. Mm. It's, going th it's going through the motions in a very realistic way, not in a completely abstract way get um, as close as possible to the to the 100 percent. this but, yeah this is the key and yeah this is the key this is where you need to do that you what you, you need to train and do what you're trying to be good at now you break it down you you you, come, you you split it up and too much you take take too much of the the kind of the, the stimuli away it becomes so far removed that it doesn't matter what you're doing with it in training because it will not transfer back however if you want to work on specific things, you do need to break it down, but you need to, to, to maintain, like there's a certain type of, a certain amount of information, especially like the reaction of your opponent on all this kind of stuff. That information has to be retained because that is integral to the technique working in real life. You take away that, which is passive drilling, it, it, it's redundant. It will not apply. It will not cross over to the actual performance. But, and again, like if you look at a striking art, for instance, it would be very, very good. You can't train 100% every day at striking because you would die. So you have to stay within the realms of safety as well. This is the thing. There's certain things you cannot train correctly. I mean, this is almost sounding like a traditional martial arts thing where it's like, yeah, we can't do it properly, guys, because you would die. It's like their reason for not doing <laughs> proper sparring. It's like, we would like to spar guys, but we probably kill five or six in the room. It's just too dangerous. Um, <laughs> Jiu-Jitsu isn't like that. We can we can ramp it up and get almost to 100%. But 100%, even if you don't get injured, is still you're still not going to be able to work on very specific things. It, you're still you still have to break it down and then constrain it into very small areas. So it's like the the passive drilling. Before I went off on my slight tangent about why that bothers me, it's like call it like black and white. So white is yeah. passive drilling. Black is sparring absolutely yeah it's like yeah. people have got a modality like a like a binary thing where it's like it's a dichotomy it's, it's one or the other it's, it's yeah whereas andy has talks about the gray zone where you slowly yeah. ramp it up it's like yeah start off i agree with pretty him. much white and as you get better yeah. at it move it through until you're just doing it in sparring that yeah. would be the perfect way to learn a technique movement pattern strategy whatever yeah, I, I, I agree with it. that. That the idea of that gray area is that that's basically what I'm talking about. But like I, I with with my guys to say we, we do this kind of 50, 60 percent, which is again, it's I mean, what is 50, 60 percent? I know it doesn't. It's a very abstract kind of idea, yeah. but they 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 learn what that is and they, they, they learn to train that way. And it's it's the same sort of thing. I refer to it as a, like a developmental range. Like I think Andy says it's a gray area. It's, it's the same thing, though. It's that middle ground. It's that it's not non-resistant and it's not 100 percent trying to kick the shit out of each other it's but it's realistic enough for the for you to learn and acquire applicable skills to full performance 
Does that make sense? Yeah. It's, it, it's a similar, I think it's a similar thing, unless I've, you know, unless he has a completely different way of looking at it, which I well, may be wrong. That's <laughs> how I've interpreted what Andy's been talking about. So, yeah. Okay. My personal way I've done that, um, because uh, what the class is like, um, the class I'm doing at the moment, uh, uh, elements it's not exactly passive but we're also we're given i'd say we're given a lot of freedom about how we're drilling it and so the way i personally like to do it because i don't know i still hate this kind of x percent kind of idea i try to just basically we drill it and we we, we go through the movement and make sure we're actually doing it right to start with and then just kind of make it abstractly harder over the course yeah. of 10 minutes or whatever we're doing these armbar variations for that's the hack i've found to not knowing what the percents are because it's yeah. a nightmare especially if you're training with a different training partner every class absolutely yeah i mean i say i say 50 60 percent but it's like <laughs> you've got to learn what that kind of is that isn't like it isn't like you all might you know what your 50 60 percent is it's like yeah you have to learn that so there's a um there's an interesting so, podcast. Do you know um, Andrew Huberman? Not a jiu-jitsu guy. Um, uh, I, I've, I've listened to some of his stuff, actually. Yes, yeah. Right. Um, so he's he seems to be getting more and more pop, very mm. ramping up a lot, like a lot more people talking about him recently. He did an excellent one. I believe the topic was skill acquisition in general. Um, yeah. And he had a really interesting, there was just one bit that's really stuck with me. Uh, and it was about... Um, it was about the success rate that you need. And it was really poorly defined, actually, about how mm, often you, you okay. should be successful. However, yeah. it did make a very good point that studies have found that, and again, poorly defined, it's anywhere between like 40% successful and 90% successful. Don't know where yeah. it is. Probably varies from skill to skill and person to person. You want to be succeeding that often. And I think... Part of the reason that, I mean, and I agree about what your point was earlier about like high belts, they say that they wait, they, they don't get anything out of training with lower belts. I, I think yeah. it's because they're just trying to do the best bit. And so what they're actually getting is 95 to 100% success rate. And so they aren't yeah. learning anything. Um, and mm -hmm. vice versa for the white belts, they're not succeeding even 40% of the time. It was also uh, yeah. Lachlan Giles, and I expect it was on BJJ Mental Models that he was talking about this um that he likes to have a i think he was saying i think it might have actually been below below 50 percent success rate because otherwise people get bored and they think they're just too good at it and they just move on um yeah. it's in like i mean everything i'm hearing and maybe i don't know maybe it's a feedback bias but no whatever, whatever you call it i'm looking for these answers but it seems yeah. that everything I'm hearing is saying that you should not be too successful or too unsuccessful um, mm. in the technique that you're learning. It's mm. just interesting to do. Like you shouldn't it's... be drilling until you're managing it every time. You should be managing. You should be doing it about sixty percent of the time. No, no. Yeah, and unless the guy is going one hundred percent and you're able to do it every time, then fine. Then, then that's great. But oh. then gets to get a better, better, better training partner, someone who's or a different shape different physical characteristics, different level, whatever. Um, so yeah, difficulty is the key thing. Like th this is the thing you, you it, it all works with difficulty. As I was saying, if it's too easy, there's no point. If it's too hard. There's also no point. And it, it's finding that, that kind of sweet spot. As far as like motivation is concerned as well. Like you don't want someone to just not get any success because they'll quit. It's as simple as that. Mm -hmm. you, need, you need some amount of success. But again, if it's too easy, you're not learning. You're not getting better, right? I've, I've said this before, like with people in training, if you, nobody should always look good in training. Like hmm. if you always look good in training, then you've, you've got a problem. Like you should look shit in training most of the time. Like I look shit in, I mean, I look shit in competition most of the time, but like if you watch me in training, I look shit a lot of the time in training because I'm trying to work on stuff that I'm not good at. And if I'm not hmm. good at it, I'm going to look shit. Now, if I train and I just play my A game, I would look, okay, I look pretty good. But if that's what I look like all the time, then I'm not getting any better. I'm not improving. Like you, you have to have a, a level of resistance in order to improve. So same with like strength and conditioning and stuff. You, you, if you keep lifting the same weight every time, you're not going to develop more strength and more power. You have to increase the weight. 
It's the same thing with this, but it's finding that that level of difficulty and it's getting people to understand that level of difficulty. Like I said before, with the condition where the, like the knee slice, if somebody, somebody knee slicing, they're fine, they can do it every time, make it harder for yourself. Like I can't go around every single person and set the conditions. I, I, I will do it to a degree. I will go around and I will set slightly different constraints with certain people because I know there's certain things they need to work on or I'll know that they'll find it too easy. But you have to take some fucking ownership of your training and you have to be able to, to modulate that yourself. I can't do that for you. Like that that's the thing. If you're finding it too easy, don't keep doing it. Make it harder. Put put another constraint in place. Put yourself further back in the sequence. Like give them another grip. Take a, a worse grip, and then go. Because then, if you're finding it slightly harder, you're making more progress. Like that. That's the thing. But it, that's the hardest thing to get across to people. But that that's the key thing. That's the key key thing to all of this is finding that optimal level of difficulty. Also, if you're getting it right every time, you have no good feedback to work on. If you're getting it wrong every time there's too much effective feedback with that mm. with when you're getting it right 50 60 percent of the time you're getting good positive feedback but then you'll you'll, you'll get feedback from your partner you'll get feedback from from intrinsically from, from from how it feels extrinsically from how they moved you will get feedback as to why that might not have worked and then you'll be able to compare that to why it did work and this again this comes down to how i get my guys to train none of this like two for two bullshit fucking stupid waste of time because like you can't you can't feed, feedback feedback back decay when it is though feedback decays over time you have feedback you need to try and reapply that into the loop and, and go again now if you have two goes and it's like okay i know something's like, oh shit it's your goes now isn't it so then he just two goes and that that feedback is decayed so i normally give three minutes and i'll say right you're doing this thing for three minutes and you continue to do it for three minutes, blah, 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 blah. So it works, it doesn't work, whatever. But every time, every little bit of feedback, you can reapply and you can go again. Like two goes is not enough to apply feedback correctly. Like, and again, any any kind of learning theory, or like it all fucking hinges on feedback and the application of feedback. Like that's hmm. pretty universally agreed across the board by most people. It's about that feedback. And if you are creating scenarios where there is not enough feedback or there is too much feedback, or they don't have time to apply that feedback, then you don't understand how to teach, which, you know, we've covered that. Why, <laughs> why, why do you think it is then that, um, what's the most amount of complaints you've had about podcasts, by the way, because um, I want to see, I think this is likely pushing the, the <laughs> um, number of things, but you know what, everything you've complained about is stuff that we've complained about as well. So yeah, um, I don't, like, again, like anyone has got a problem with it, any, <laughs> I, I go over it, I'm a bit, yeah, I'm, I'm, look, I'm passionate, that's what it is, I'm just passionate about it, that's what it is, I'm passionate about people being stupid, um, <laughs> the, 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 like, if anyone has, there are, for all the stuff I'm saying, there are counter arguments, okay, I'm not saying this is how it is, I'm not certain at all, like, I think this is how it works, um, but I don't, I don't know, I might be completely wrong with a lot of stuff. I don't think I'm completely wrong with stuff, but I may be slightly wrong with things. And there are plenty of counter arguments. And this is still a very, the application of this to the grappling arts is still very, very early days. This is really experimental. Okay. We don't know much. We don't have much data to kind of work on. So like I, any kind of criticism or people that are pissed off, if they have a really good argument for why I'm wrong, like yeah, I, I, I absolutely listen to it. I want to listen to it. Because again, like you were saying before about the whole confirmation bias thing, like I, I know what I kind of think, but I, to be fair, I spend a lot more of my time reading stuff that opposes what my, where my views are, because hmm. I really want to know that I am right. I don't just want to solidify my views and have people kind of, you know, pay me lip service as it were and, and confirming what I'm thinking. I want anything that says I'm wrong, I'm, I want to read it because I want to find out why and I want to look into that in case they've got a point. I will learn more from that than just confirming it from, you know, reading or listening to people that agree with me. Of course, of course. Well, then you've probably thought about this one already. So I'm interested to hear why is it you think that, all right, so we've got this set up in jujitsu. We know how jujitsu is taught most of the time, but mm. as far as I know, and I'm not exactly spoken to a lot of world champions one-to-one, 
people have people this is how they've learned it this is how they've learned it most of Absolutely. the time right is it just that they've had enough time sparring or what, what what's your explanation for why this learning method has worked for those people it's been the it's been the, the primary learning method like that this is the thing like it's a numbers game isn't it if you have 99.9 percent .9 of the people doing one way and you know, point zero percent doing another way. It's the likelihood is you, you're going to get more successful people from that group. If you look at the high level guys, like and and again, there will be they spent the the mat time is is it's, it's an unavoidable thing. It, it, it's you have to do if you want to get good at jiu-jitsu, grappling, catch wrestling, whatever. You have to spend time doing it. Okay, you have to spend a significant amount of time doing that. Okay. It needs to be in a very specific way. I mean, it's not a case of just doing 10,000 hours and misinterpreting, you know, Ericsson's work like Gladwell did, but like it's, it's, it has to be a, a specific type of training. Um, the, what you find is they, if you look at a lot of high level guys, you speak to a lot of high level guys, they do a lot of positional training. And this is, this is where it differs. They do a lot of positional sparring. Okay. So that is a very, very similar thing. They get to a point where they don't do a great deal of passage really. And there are some people that do, but a lot of them will just spend a lot of time doing positional sparring because that would allow them to work on areas of their game that they want to work on and repeat it. And almost it's, it's like, it's the whole kind of Bernstein like repetition without repetition. It's, it's repeating a, a technique or a movement in a certain scenario over and over again. But again, the conditions are never going to be absolutely identical and replicated but that positional sparring is the key for it now the intensity of it like that, that depends on the person but you're going to find the higher level guys will have spent a significant amount of time live sparring they've mm. probably spent more time live sparring in positional sparring as well this is just a theory i have no idea i can't back this up at all it's like i, I can't say this is the case but my theory would be they've spent more time live sparring and there's probably probably spent more time live sparring in positional broken down positions but I, I may be wrong nobody's won a world championship by purely doing passive drilling we don't do yeah. kata so <laughs> it's just you know that's i'd be very very surprised i'd be very surprised at the top level if somebody had a significant amount of like passive drilling time still in their game and even mm -hmm. then i'd be like wow you're really good and you'd spend you spend 30 percent of your time still doing passive drilling you could be so good. <laughs> That's the thing. It's like, they could be, it's not a case of, all well, they do this. It's like, yeah, oh my God, how much better could they be if they didn't do that though? Like, mm. that's the thing, but there is no way of, of proving that. Like, there's no experimental conditions within jiu-jitsu and competition stuff. It's like, it's yeah. hard to do that. We yeah. can't do that. Well, and apparently it's, it's, it's unethical to, to do that with beginners. There you go. <laughs> yeah, what's the, um, what's the weird Latin phrase? Um, Okay, ignoring what the Latin phrase is, it's the just because it, it's a uh, you know just because it happened in order doesn't mean that one thing happened because of the last one. Like no, no. so correlation does not no, cause. No, it's like... Sorry, yeah, correlation does not cause correlation. Yeah, yeah, yes, does not. Um, it doesn't. Cause... Yeah. Correlation is not causation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Correlation can be Alex, because yes. <laughs> there can be a strong correlation, <laughs> and it could be due to a third variable which wasn't wasn't measured. That could be the causation. But yeah, absolutely. Like this is true. This is true. Mm -hmm. But just because that's the way it looks, that we don't we can't break it down and divide it up into variables and understand what variable played a bigger part than the other. Like mm. it's, it's not it's not how life works, unfortunately. Um, but yeah, I know. I, I think Lockman was talking about it. He was he was talking about trying to run a, a randomized control trial with um, with beginners. Because um, I know he's he's started doing this. So I mentioned more about this this flip classroom thing. Yes, I've been wanting to. I, I did a I, I did a bunch of lectures like over a year ago on Zoom with my guys during the lockdown, and one of them was focused on on, on structures of class and, and structures of learning. And we went over the flip classroom and the idea of, of this kind of stuff. And I hadn't found a way to apply it. And Lockman, Lockman's kind of partially applied it, which is quite interesting. Because I always found an issue of like, not everyone is as obsessed and addicted as, as, as we are. So they won't do the homework. Whereas what Lockman has done, he's given people individual modules and things to work on. Mm -hmm. And then they come in and they do it. But he's also running a, a standard class as well for those people who just want to come in and learn a technique. 
Now, I never really thought about that. I think I was quite one thing or another. I was like, well, we're either going to do flip classroom or we're not. Whereas now he's, he's kind of gone half and half, which is quite interesting. Um, and then obviously the sub meta website kind of like links into that. Mm-hmm. Um, he's got a, it, it's a good, it's a good way of, um, it, it's a good way of doing it. Um, I'd be interested to see how that works. And he was, I think he was talking about, I, I think it was to do with um, possibly with ecological uh, dynamics and, and kind of emotion processing, like having two beginner groups, like completely new people coming in and you divide them into one style of training, like passive drilling and one, style of training which is more to do with um more live training more maybe ecological dynamic like constraints based or constraints led training um and seeing who did best um mm. the ethical issues of this i know like, i've from like kind of my academic background i know getting through ethics is a fucking nightmare they <laughs> are not good with this and i guarantee you like, you're not you're not going to be able to get ethics for just randomly doing this in a jiu-jitsu club because like you, one group, if one group is potentially better than the other group, you're. It, it's. I think it might be classed as like misleading or fraud on the on the crap group. Uh, um, <laughs> so it could be quite interesting. Because if you think about a medical trial, it's the same sort of thing. It's like. But what if, if a know, person? I don't know how you, if a person gives consent, if you if, if that, you consent, that would make it slightly different. Yeah, yeah. If maybe you could you could have but them as, as well. Say, yeah, sorry, as yeah. well. The other issue I thought about with with that is you've got no control over what they do when they leave that that gym. Now, some people are going to go home and they're just going to watch TV and they're not going to care. Some people are mm. going to go home, they're still going to be pissed do? about the fact they got caught, caught with that Kimura and they're going to spend three hours on YouTube figuring out how to defend Kimuras. <laughs> and that completely fucks up the conditions. Yeah, um, It's so hard to, to kind of do that. Um, again, I've, I've considered looking at having entrance exams as well. Um, so looking for certain characteristics in people right. that I know are going to be better jiu jitsu people. Hang on, you're going to have entrance exams for your gym. Okay. All right. Okay. Okay. <laughs> this is going to sound mental. All right. It <laughs> sounds mental. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> not, not an, okay. I say entrance exam. I mean, not an entrance exam. So there's certain characteristics in like jiu jitsu or certain, um, certain mental characteristics that I believe make you more inclined to do well in jiu jitsu and grappling and, and various, I mean, basically anyone who's good in like the STEM industry, like science, technology, engineering, manuf- uh, mathematics. Okay. So, you know, the group I'm looking for now. So I'm, if you look at elite level jujitsu people, okay, you make a list of all the elite level guys. I guarantee there'd be a very, very, very high percentage of them who had autistic traits and they were high functioning autistics and they were hyper systemizers. I, I'm very confident about this now. I mean, obviously Mikey Musumeki's, an extreme case but you i mean look people like gordon ryan all these guys now i'm not talking about somebody who has been diagnosed as as being autistic because that's a different thing mm-hmm. i'm talking about somebody who has certain autistic traits someone who is on again it's such a negative thing and it has such a stigma to say somebody's on the spectrum mm. but that that is what I'm, I'm i'm interested in to a degree i'm looking at these people who are on the spectrum but they're high functioning on the spectrum the, these these people they have certain things that is going to make them better at jiu-jitsu if you can get them into jiu-jitsu. And the, again, when we finish the podcast, just go through all the top-level guys and just, just think about it. Like, what I want to do is I, I want to have, like, a... I'm, this is going to sound so insane. People are going to think I'm even crazier than normal. Like, I, I have, like, a, a battery of tests that I want to give to people um, when they when they apply. Um and it will look at, it will give me an idea of where they kind of are uh, on certain things. And there's kind of, there's three things I'm lo- I want to look at. Two of them are to do with uh, spectrum disorder. Um, and it's to do with, th- there's a guy called Simon Baron Cohen, who, yes, is related to, to Sasha Baron Cohen. <laughs> he, yep. he's, his, he's his cousin. He's his cousin. Simon Baron Cohen is like the head of, of, of the Autism Research Centre in Cambridge. And he's like, he's very, very well established in, in, in the world of kind of, um, of, of autism and, and various things. He has a, a theory, which basically it looks at autism from, again, it's, it's a, it's a continuum, like a, from one, one extreme to another, you have empathizers and you have systemizers. Now what that you would have is you would, you would never have someone who is high, high on the, on the empathizing scale and high on the systemizing scale that it just doesn't happen you have a divide with that and the people that that fall 
within the high level of hyper or like systemizers, like the hyper systemizers are, are, are on the spectrum. So it uses it as a way of, of identifying autism. Now, this is this is talking about autism, it's not talking about any kind of kind of comorbidity with any intellectual disabilities as well or any other things, because there are a lot of things that can kind of occur with autism. But those hyper systemizers are the people that you are going to find in in like the STEM industry. You are going to find them in Silicon Valley, in, in, in places like Rotterdam, in places like that. These are the people that work well with patterns, basically, the, the pattern recognition. This is what grappling is, basically. Grappling is, mm -hmm. is, is human pattern recognition. It is a live restraint restraint based pattern recognition game like that's what it is so we're looking for people with uh, well i i say we i'm not going to drag anyone else into this this is purely my insanity <laughs> um i'm looking i'm looking for people who have this neurodiversity and have a, a wiring or a, a neurological makeup which predisposes them to be better pattern, pattern recognizers and that is basically people with them like on the spectrum so, so i have been trying to create an autistic <laughs> grappling super team. don't make it sound like that i think I, I, what i'm saying i think I'd end, saying, i think i would end i think probably me and alex would hypothetically be able to end up in this team so i'm not using it in an insulting way you'd be surprised <laughs> you would be surprised <laughs> like, who if you you can get these uh, the, the 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 empathy and the systemizer quotient, you can get them. They're, they're free on the internet. You can get them. Uh, you got to figure out how to mark them and how to grade them. Mm -hmm. um, I, I would go that route because I do. I would never want to do like the autistic trait and like a diagnostic autistic because because I I don't want to. I'm not qualified to diagnose autism or anything like that, and I don't want to. <laughs> I, I sure. don't, like it's this is this is where the the problem is. Yeah. Like and again it's. It, it, it's something that like I'm, I'm quite passionate about it anyway. Like I, I'm, I'm very interested in this this side of things, and I, I believe that like autism, especially like developmental disorder, especially the high functioning, is so poorly like understood, and it's so mm. it's so poorly dealt with. Like if you look at anyone who has made a significant impact on the world, like your you know, your, your Thomas Edison's, your, your Bill Gates, your Alan Turing's, like all. Come on, man. They're all they're all very very high on the spectrum, and it's terrifying to think how many we've lost because of the way the education system works. Mm. How many of these people that could have gone on to change the world, but the education system ruined them? Now jujitsu can save them. Like, this is the key. So we can bring them. I, in. I don't. I mean, I, I, it's, a, I, it's a positive. It's a positive as far as I'm concerned. I don't see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I would never use the term disability because it's a, it's a positive. Yeah. It's just a different neurological makeup, but it's it's not catered for in modern society. Jiu-jitsu like we don't can cater. save them, though. No, it's, it's no longer an autistic okay, super team. Cut, cut an that, autistic. because that sounds mental. That <laughs> doesn't sound like... <laughs> that doesn't sound... I mean, look, the, the way... The way... The, the way with, with things like autism and stuff anyway, like I, I am in no way am I a specialist or anything. I'm just a... You know, I, I read into these things, and I'm a casual kind of reader observer. I'm not a specialist. I don't have any qualifications in autism or anything like that. 100%. Okay? I don't want to claim any of that shit. Like, it, 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 a lot of the time, they, they, they want, they will fixate and they will have an addiction. They will, they will want to do something. Like, and if you let them do that, and they, they tend to specialize. They're almost like, they almost want to, the, the way their neurological makeup works is they almost want to specialize early. Hmm. They know what they want to do early and no one else does. Whereas with spectrum disorder, they, they kind of will, will latch onto something they want to do it early. But the general schooling system won't let them. The general schooling yeah. system will try and fit them into this this overall approach. And it won't allow them to just go off and, and, and kind of specialize. Mm. So but that that ability to kind of hyper hyper focus and, and almost like addictive. I mean, how many times have you talked about heard a baby go, Oh, Jiu Jitsu is addictive? Yeah. Oh, right, it's addictive, it's addictive. Constantly. Well, it's the same thing. This is what I'm talking about. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Those people that really get hooked. Mm. I guarantee, well, I, I, I can't guarantee all those people that really get hooked and carry on. I believe you will probably get a correlation, which isn't a causation. I, <laughs> you will get a correlation with the systemization question of, of Baron Cohen. And I just kind of want to identify those. It's like scouting players. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard though. You might, you might end up, uh, you might end up broke. <laughs> yeah. 
and I imagine there are so many other like barriers that would come up as well. It's like it seems easy. It seems like oh my god, this makes sense. It would perfectly work. There's probably so much shit that would go wrong. Maybe you so, can. Like, maybe you I, can I, do I, it I think like, there's, there's, like there's something there. Maybe you can do something like Lucky uh, Lachlan, where where you've got a team. Yeah. <laughs> You're trying to find a. a but again, a it's like like this is like we're, we're talking like ethics, like ethically. Who the hell am I to get? <laughs> Like a load of people that, that that potentially have undiagnosed autism and a load of like, again, like what you would class as average or normal people, which is just madness to say that. Who the fuck am I to put two groups of this and like separate <laughs> them and try and do some randomly un, like unregulated research? Like I just, I don't, don't think I, I don't think I can get away with it. So, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's an interesting thought. The it's num- an interesting thought. The number all, I yeah. warned you about the tangents. Oh, that, yeah, no, that's not even. I'm, I'm just worried you're just going to get sued for all your worth. Like, I don't know what's going to happen, <laughs> but like, I'm not. I, this is this so is really coming out. There are so many that. pitfalls you could fall. And again, this. and again, and again, and again. In no way is this a negative thing. This is like I, I think. I, I think that the no, this right. kind of so we, autism is, is it's, it's a it's a it's an absolute positive, and it's not. It's the fact that what the only the, the negative about this is that this happens so often. You have so many people who have this kind of this neurological makeup, and they just get they almost get wasted. They have so much ta- potential and talent to achieve an obscene amount in a certain area, but they don't get educated correctly. You don't get looked after correctly. You are completely correct. Like. It, like increasingly so within the tech space i i mean I, I think it's not exactly controversial to say that people who are who've got these tendencies that you're talking about mm. do very well within the tech space which nowadays absolutely they're, they're fantastic yeah that's where that that yeah. that's that's where change in the world is happening yeah for, for good or bad for good or bad it's where change is happening it's where you can make a lot of money quite reliably if that's what we're going to value absolutely it's, yeah, I it's mean, like this is it. It's like it's it's accept, it's accepting that people are different, and and that that's the thing. It's, it's trying to with with people with these certain attributes and traits. It's trying to push them down the the, the typical kind of route, the the, the normal route that the, the average person does, and that's not how they work. They will fail again. It's the, this whole idea if you if you judge a fish on its ability to climb a tree, it'll all think it's stupid or whatever. That that kind of quote. It's that idea because it's it's just ignoring some super potential specialist area they have and just going no no you have to try and you have, no you have to do english maths science geography blah 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 blah, blah. you have to do all of that bollocks because i will know that this is what they're going to do this is what they want to do this is what they're you know and they will probably become top of the field with it hmm. like but it's it's the it's the education system in i still think most countries that that, that do that yeah. However, it would cost a lot of money to create an education system that was able to cater for that. So there's, you know, there's a there's a potential pitfall with that. Um, but yeah, screening for jujitsu. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, you're it's gonna, interesting. You're make it, this, is, this is going to be the new brand of jujitsu cult. We've talked about I like, I like the name. Also, this is going to be. A... I do. I do yeah. like the name of your club, though. Institute of Grappling is like. It's like it, it. It brings that scientific element to it. I think just just the name. It of sounds it. quite. It's, just, uh, it's intellectual academic. snobbery. That's what it is. Yeah, yeah. It's intellectual, <laughs> intellectual snobbery. snobbery. Isn't, it isn't is. that Nassim Taleb uh, said that or something? Like. <laughs> oh <laughs> yeah, I'm a big fan. I'm a big fan of Taleb. Yeah, I'm yeah, a big, big fan of Taleb. Yeah. I have like go to a lot of city workers and traders, and they hate him, obviously. You know, yeah, but but that's actually, is- if if for like a second we can go go back to um because we just we talked about Taleb. I, I know we're probably like close to wrapping up, but um I, I found I was I had this thought in my head as we were talking about um old styles of uh, of learning and like old styles of drilling because he talks about. Have you heard mm. him talk about the Lindy effect? Okay. Um, yes. Yeah. 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 And and I was trying to so so a Lindy effect uh, for those that don't know is is the idea that something that has um, been uh, successful for a long period of time or has remained in um, in in use and circulation for a long period of time, the prediction is that it will probably continue to do so for mm-hmm. another period of time as it has in the past. So it's 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 like the, problem the effect. Is, the problem, yeah. What yeah. we're talking about, yeah. Basically, yeah. what we're talking about. 
and and um and I don't know, he he seems to talk about it in an almost positive way. Like that's a good thing. That if something yeah. if something's persisted for a long time, it means that it stood the test of time. So it means that it's it's a positive thing. But but I it's I have a dichotomy in my head, especially when it comes to jujitsu, because that can't be right. That doesn't feel right, especially in, in the things we've it's, talked about. Yeah, it's I think that there's a I'm sure there's a someone's figured out a number with it. If like something has persisted for so many years, there's a chance it will persist for another so many years. And it, it tends to be the longer something has, has, has worked for, the longer it will continue to work for. It's basically early fails kind of will, will not will not kind of last. It's like so yeah. it's it's an interesting and that that could again it could come down to like you, you could you could argue that something has lasted for so long, has been successful for so long. The reason it will continue to be successful is because of the refusal for people to change mm. because they're so embedded in that approach that it will continue for so many years because they will not accept another way of doing it because it's so ingrained and it's so familiar for them so you can argue that linear effect is down to the, the fact that it's people are not wanting to change certain things and it's again if something's not broke if it ain't broke don't fix it but if you've only done it one way you don't know if it's broke like mm. with jiu-jitsu it's yeah, hard I to think... tell people it's broke because they've always done it this way. What's what's better? What's there's there's no there's never been another way. And I think so also it, to be fair, when, to we, when we're talking about jujitsu, it actually hasn't been that long, so it's hard. You no. can't actually apply the Lindy effect no. to it. To be fair, because it, it's been such a short period of time. Yeah. yeah, you just got to look at the development and, and the way things have changed the last four or five years with the leg locks and the wrestling and everything. It's like it's so. It, it changes so much. It changes mm. so so much. Um, going back to Taleb, <laughs> I have like I've started using one of his terms. Uh, he had a whole book on uh, called Anti Fragile. Yeah. You know, the, so this the, the term anti fragility. It's like it's, I really like the term anti fragility, and it's the, the approach that I now I kind of take to my my kind of defensive jujitsu, as it were. So you have the idea of something being fragile, and like if he gets attacked, he gets broken, and then the opposite of fragile most people will say like robust or unbreakable or something which isn't the opposite of fragile because it means if something gets broken down the opposite isn't that it won't get broken down the opposite is that under stress or under an external pressure it would actually get stronger which is what anti-fragility is mm. so fragile is you you something gets attacked or stressed it breaks the middle ground is robustness and it's defending it's be be becoming good at defending in my opinion and that means you get attacked and you you remain strong you you're on you're not broken down you're robust mm. the the approach i like and it this is where my kind of like defensive style of jiu-jitsu and my my working from bad positions comes to i don't just want to survive and get out i want to use bad positions to get to a better position so i want to look this idea of anti-fragility of when someone attacks me and puts me in a bad position i want to be able to use that to get to a better position there you want to come from I have, or not just survive so the anti-fragility thing with me works around the Kimura system. So what I have with, I have a whole, whole system around an anti-Kimura system, which is basically, like, I refer to it as anti-fragility. When somebody gets a Kimura on you, that's a strong position. You're in a bad position, okay? Fragile response would be they finish you, they take you back. A robust response would be that you would be able to defend it and they wouldn't be able to finish the Kimura and they wouldn't be able to transition. An anti-fragile response would be they take a Kimura and you take their back off it. Or they take a Kimura and everyone knows you can arm boss them off the Kimura yes, and yes, you've yes. seen the whole Matt Hughes GSP thing. But I, I'm working with this idea of basically anytime somebody Kimura's me, I just go behind them from every position. Like it works very, very well. Someone picks a, if I take a single leg and someone grabs a Kimura on me, I just go behind them. That's all I do. Mm. It's I the love, same thing. It's I anti fragile. Idea. I train with Dom, so I'm not fucking getting behind it. Yeah. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you a shit I'm gonna send you a shitload of stuff to fuck up his Kimura again. Okay. Yes. <laughs> there's, there's certain things. There's certain things in my gym. There's certain things that don't work. We have a list. Okay. That is genuine professional. Americanas. So work, Americanas right? don't work. Okay. Well, yeah. they work for there's three, there's, there's three things. There's three things in the gym that don't work anymore. Okay. Right. Americanas don't work. Okay. The task I have is I've said to everybody, find me a video of Americana working at top level. No one's found it yet. Americanas don't work. Outside heel hooks no longer work, unfortunately. I, I believe they're pretty much they're pretty much done. Because you give the there's too much back exposure and the finishing mechanics are too weak and there's no naivety now. So yeah. 
Third one is Gamoras don't work. So <laughs> this is a stretch. Um, you've got to be careful with Gamoras. If you have this anti-fragile approach to Gamoras, as soon as someone gets a Gamora on you, it's not about defending. It's not about, you know, trying to, as soon as someone gets a Gamora on you, attack them, go behind them, find a way to go behind them straight away. Okay. So from a bad position, it becomes a good position. They attack you, you become stronger. It's anti-fragile. You go behind, you take the bat, you finish. So it's a mindset thing. You, you really now, disclaimer it. wise, if you do this to Dom and he breaks your arm, I will not take any responsibility for you whatsoever. <laughs> okay. Because you've heard the last two hours. I'm insane. Don't <laughs> listen to me. <laughs> I, you really ramped up the controversy there. Like, Americanas, yeah. Americanas I, don't work. Yeah. Come on, man. No, no, you're right. Yeah, you're you right. Have... That's what I'm saying. You've ramped up the controversy. Americana is a Americana. very good setup for an arm triangle. I, I think the That's only it. position I've seen Americanas work at a sort of reasonable level is like from you're a mount to provide evidence from a mount to provide like evidence purely from mounted crucifix and it's the only well, time i've seen it work okay um modifications only yeah. position potentially outside heel hook you know what it's a stretch to say they don't work they don't work as well as they did because the naivety is not there they are mm. not as strong as people believe they were four or five years ago yes because now people understand the mechanics of life and that hits the nail on they the head. are if you all you have to do is look at the statistic. I, I, um, going back to Andy again, um, he broke down ADCC stuff a few years back. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and he did all that. Heel, outside heel hooks are really, really high. If you look at the recent ADCC trials and stuff, wow, right down. Inside heel hooks, RNC, guillotines are relatively high as well. But outside heel hooks have gone completely down. Kimura, so, that is a controversial statement that. It's difficult because okay. Kimura, it, it's it, uh, as a submission, it's one thing, and as a, as a, as a transitional tool and control position, it's another thing. Don't get me wrong; mm-hmm. I still teach Kimura trap and Kimura system. I think it's very, very strong. Um, I'm just, you know, I just like using crazy, like clever little buzzwords like anti-fragile and attaching them to something that would be yeah. well. Well, so, no, but it's, I mean, it, it's, 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 it's Nassim, books... Nassim Taleb would be proud because that's yeah. basically what he does. He just pisses I mean, those off. books are, so... are basically <laughs> mental models, aren't they? So they're, they're supposed to be actually applicable to other things yeah, if you can yeah. apply them. I find, um, like with, with Taleb's books, like they're, they're applicable to so much. Yeah. Like the whole, um, the, the Inserto series, the whole series yeah. is like that. Obviously, Black's, there's Black Swan, there's the, the, the Better Procrustes, is all, all like, and Anti Fragility is a very, very good one as well. They're, they're all, he, he, it's kind of, most people see him around like uh, kind of economics and finance and that sort of stuff, but it's, he's, he, he applies it to everything. And he's yeah. got such a good way of writing as well. It's like anyone who hasn't read any of um, Nassim Nicholas Taleb stuff, I suggest definitely you definitely read it. I, I read really, uh, Skin in the Game. So good. Um, I read Brilliant Skin in the one. Game yeah. and I haven't I haven't got I got uh, anti fragility but I haven't read it yet and yeah it's just Skin in the Game you read through that it's it's one of those books and you see it in the reviews like people will mm. uh slate him and say like he's cocky he's all this stuff but if you get past <laughs> that if you get past the cockiness it's actually yeah. a really good book oh, and, yeah. and it's yeah He's very opinionated. He's, he comes across quite arrogant and stuff, but like some some really really good ideas. And again, yeah. he comes out with the ideas that a lot of people aren't wanting to kind of say. And I think that's why people see him as a bit arrogant because he's he's coming out with stuff that goes against what a lot of people are thinking. Yeah. Um. As I say, like all the all the traders and the, the, the bankers absolutely hate him. But the same with Daniel Kahneman as well because he basically Kahneman Tversky basically made it quite clear that it's luck working in the, <laughs> in the finance industry. There's no skill there. There's quite a lot of studies behind it. So again, a load of my students are going to have a go at me about this. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you enjoyed that episode. If you did, please consider subscribing to the podcast and checking us out on YouTube, Facebook, and Instagram under the name Combat Thoughts. We'll see you next time. <laughs>